Hey everybody, welcome back to Sense 15. Uh, before we get started today with our usual topics of our first simulation that we had started on Wednesday, uh, just a couple of uh, brief, I don't want to call them, I guess just points about the class. Um, they're not really reminders or anything like that. Um, the first is that um, our TA Bridge has posted her office hours on our course syllabus. So if I switch over there really quick, uh, if you scroll down a little bit um, underneath office hours, um, I will reveal these after stream because this is probably the video that's going to be posted. So I don't want those to be up on YouTube, but you know, it wouldn't be the end of the world anyway. Um, so her office hours will be set here. Um, they're Monday 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. and Wednesday um, 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. And those are in addition to mine from uh, 11 to 1 on Thursdays. Um, so please feel free to um, pop into those office hours. We also recorded last week a little um, introduction video. Uh, Breeze and myself did. Um, so if you'd like to meet Breeze before we, uh, or before you pop into one of her office hours, kind of learn a little bit about what she's doing now, um, what she did previously, what's her experience with the department, that sort of thing. Um, we've got that video posted here on our Canvas page. Um, so you can take a look at that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is unrelated to um, anything with uh, Breeze or RTA, but recently I've been having a little bit of eye trouble. Um, so around uh, maybe every other day or so for about 20 minutes, um, I'll lose a little bit of vision in one eye. Which you can imagine if you're staring at a computer screen trying to code, it's kind of hard when you can't see exactly where you're looking at. Um, so should something like that come up over the next few days, um, I may have to stop the lecture. It only takes about 20 minutes for it to 20 or 30 minutes for it to clear up, but when the class is only 50 minutes, it's kind of a big chunk. Um, but one of the two recordings, either the the morning recording or the evening recording, well or I guess early afternoon or late afternoon recording um, will be okay because it doesn't last very long. So it may happen over the next few weeks or so that um, one of the two lectures has to get cut short a little bit. Um, I can see right now there's a small dot in my eye. Um, hasn't gotten any bigger yet, so we should be okay for the rest of today. Uh, but I just wanted to give you a heads up in case something like that happens. Uh, the recording will still be fine. It'll be available on YouTube um, like it always is, uh, but individual lectures might have to get trimmed down a little bit in, in some circumstances. Um, so let's switch back over to Excel and work on our first um, simulation of the class, uh, which we had gotten to previously. Uh, at least this far, right? We had sort of sketched out um, what we were trying to accomplish. Uh, that thing that we were trying to accomplish was a simulation of a random walk. Um, and we had shown the final product, um, which is this screen over here, where we imagine a red ball or a red particle or something like that. Um, and it takes random steps, either going right, up, left, or down. Um, and it does those randomly. And the spinner that I've got set up here um, will simulate those steps for us. Um, the project that we're going to do doesn't actually need to use the spinner. It's a little bit more complicated than what we need. Um, we're just going to get to the point where we can simulate all 100 or later 1,000 or 10,000 or whatever number of steps we want until our final project looks kind of like this or the final product looks kind of like that. Uh, but we're not going to worry about trying to automate it where we or trying to, I guess, unautomate it where we can use that um, spin button to increment the number of simulation steps that we've had. We're, we're just going to simulate them all at once without really any kind of user interface uh, like a controller or something like that. Um, and that is what had brought us to um, our drawings and our discussion yesterday, uh, which was we're going to imagine, like I said, taking a, a unit step in one of those directions. Um, and then when we take a step in that direction, updating the current position of the particle. So like this uh, writing that I've got over here on the right, um, if we were to step right, we would add 1 to x, but leave y alone, right? We don't add anything to y. Um, and if we were to step down, uh, then we would add uh, or we would subtract 1 from y, um, but not change x, right? It just takes the same x. Um, and we do that over and over and over and over again. Um, and that concept of doing something over and over and over and over again, we said was called iteration. Um, more general, I, I should say more specifically in MATLAB, when we want to do an iteration, we'll get, we're going to end up using a for loop. Um, the reason we're studying this here in Excel is because we can kind of see what that for loop is doing at every step of the way 
all spread out all at once. Um, so there's there's not like a black box of, of MATLAB doing its um, for loop. We are, however, going to start um, our first bit of sort of introductory coding ideas um, before we actually introduce MATLAB. Uh, MATLAB will probably show up on Wednesday. Um, that, that would be my guess, is towards the end of the day Wednesday, we will um, start introducing MATLAB, kind of learning its interface and, and maybe doing some of the simpler things that we've done um, previously. So it is coming up pretty soon, probably on Wednesday, definitely on Friday. But one of the things that's helpful, and it's not so much coding for MATLAB, but just coding in general, um, is to create what's called pseudocode, uh, which is not machine readable. So the, the computer is not going to be able to know what it is you're doing. Um, it's there for you as a way of trying to sort of tell yourself what you expect the computer to do, uh, and then you build up from that the actual code that you want. Um, so we're going to uh, structure the pseudocode to do um, what we are, oh, wrong window over here, what we are seeing in a plot that looks like this, and in a way that follows the steps that I described last time. So we start at 0, 0, um, and then we move out uh, from there in random steps, um, either right, left, up, or down, um, one of those. So let's start with that um, pseudocode. So I'll give myself a new page here and call this pseudocode. I'll zoom in a little bit too so you can see that. Uh, there's 120, 130. Um, and I'm going to, again, freeze the panes here um, because we are going to end up um, using some of the space uh, over on the left as notes um, this time around. So let's type our pseudocode here. Actually, e, yeah, E is OK. So what's the first thing that we do? Uh, if we think about the structure of that uh, code that we had um, set up on the previous page, uh, the first thing that we're going to do um, is initialize the particle. And specifically, we're going to initialize it at the point 0, 0, right? That's the first place that it shows up is 0, 0. Uh, and then we have to figure out you know, what happens to it, obviously, um, after that. I'm also going to add, I know it, it's going to be um, two different things on here. I'm going to add some comments over here on the right in a moment. Um, so we will come back to that. Uh, that's why I'm kind of messing with the cell sizes here. It'll become a little bit more apparent uh, in a moment. What do we do after we initialize it? Well, the next thing we, that we do uh, is start our simulation loop, right? So we're going to do a, one thing over and over and over and over again here. For this particular example, we're going to do it 100 times. Um, so for 100 steps, that for keyword there, I'm using that specifically because uh, when we ended our talk last time, I had said to do an iteration in MATLAB, we usually use something called a for loop. Um, and so I'm trying to introduce that notation here in our, our pseudocode. What do we do once we're inside the pseudocode? Well, the first thing that we do is pick a random direction. Right, we're going to choose one of the four directions that we have to go. And then once we've gone and chosen that particular direction, we have to update the position of the particle. Update particle position. So that's the second part of what I had said, right, where we add one or subtract one or add zero um, to one of the uh, coordinates of our, our particle. And I put that inside of this for loop or this pseudo for loop because that type of iteration, pick a direction, update position, direction, position, direction, position, blah, blah, blah. We're going to do that over and over and over again. Uh, in pseudocode, there are different ways that you can say, OK, I'm done with that uh, iteration. I'm going to use the keyword end uh, because that's the word that we use in uh, MATLAB to say, OK, I'm done with that loop. Um, you don't have to keep going through that loop anymore. And then the last thing that we want to do um, is plot position. So plotting the position is sort of a, a follow-up of after we've done our simulation, what else is there to do, right? Presumably there's some kind of an analysis. So this is pseudocode. You can't write it like that in a programming language. It's there for us, right? It's there to communicate to either someone else or most likely communicate to you, like you in the future, what it is you're trying to accomplish. Now I'm going to add a few comments over here on the right uh, just to get you used to seeing what comments would look like in MATLAB. They're going to start with a percentage sign um, and then 
you can write whatever you want after that, and it's a it's a comment. This far, first part about initializing a particle location to zero zero, we would call that the initialization step. Not surprising, right? It has the word initialize already in it. Um, we call that the initialization setup or step. It may consist of more than one step, right? Here we only have one particle that we're worried about, and it's going to sit there at zero zero, um, but it could be 100 particles, we could be initializing grid spacings or time steps or all kinds of stuff, right? It's all things that kind of happen before the simulation is really off and going. Um, we call that the initializ initialization step. The next part that's on here, um, at least in the way that I've got it right here, um, is perform the simulation, or I should say start the simulation loop. Right? You're saying, I'm going to do this 100 times, that's the start of the loop. The stuff that happens inside the loop, that's the actual simulation. So we can say that this is where we're going to perform the simulation. There can there can be lots of lines in there. We're going to go through more complicated simulations here shortly uh, that require more than just pick a position or pick a direction and then update the position. All of that is sort of perform the simulation. There might be other steps in there as well about you know collecting data and making notes of things and writing to files and that kind of stuff. Um, all of that is sort of uh, bundled inside of there. We're not doing any of that in this particular simulation, but it, it could be within that loop as it goes. And then the last part that we've got down here uh, at the bottom where we're plotting the position, this is sort of a post analysis. Right, after we're all done with the simulation, there's probably something that we needed to learn from it. Um, often that will look like a plot in this class, um, but it'll also be calculating various quantities based off of something that was happening in the simulation. And we're going to practice that here too. We probably won't get that um, until Wednesday, um, but lots of different things can come in the post analysis, right? It just depends on what it is we're, we're trying to calculate um, inside of here. So what I'm going to do today uh, in order to actually do this simulation is we're going to go through what does this pseudocode look like when it's implemented in Excel. Um, and that's going to be pretty close to the way that it looks in MATLAB. The difference and the reason why we're starting in Excel is because we can see all of the steps all of the time, right? There's, there's no black box that says like, oh, I was clever and put all of that stuff into our code somewhere, and it just sort of you know, gets lost in the mix. Um, so it's nice that Excel allows us to visualize these steps. Um, that's not always the case, but it's a great learning tool um, if you've never seen one of these for loops execute um, in something like MATLAB. It's usually too fast for you to see, and there's no updates or anything like that. It's just you click a button and a number pops out, right? And you have no idea what happened, um, if you haven't done it a lot. Um, as you get through the class, of course, then we won't have to set it up in Excel first. So we're just going to go write down our pseudocode um, and see how each of those get implemented in Excel. The first one is to initialize the particle at 0, 0. So we're going to have to start with an x and a y coordinate, um, and I'm going to call them 0 and 0, because that's where we're starting. Easy initialization, so I'll go ahead and mark that as complete, which, by the way, other things unrelated to the class. Winston is asleep right over here. Um, he may get up and ask to be put down in a little bit. Like, not put down, but put on the floor um, in a little bit. So keep an eye out for Winston. OK, next up, for 100 steps, right? So somehow we have to tell Excel that we would like to do something 100 times. Um, there are different ways to do that in MATLAB. At least in Excel, we're going to use that um, drag and drop, that sort of autofill feature of, of dragging cells down after it's picked up the pattern uh, in order to say, I'm going to do this 100 times. So I'm going to include that sort of imaginary index column. Um, and I again, I call it imaginary not because it's not real. It's, it's obviously real. It's right there in front of us. Um, but it's not often a vector that we have to explicitly state is present. Uh, it's usually just kind of along for the ride. It's implied by the structure of the data that we're using. Um, so I'm going to put this as light gray again, um, because it's not really um, something that we often have to include. So I'm going to start the pattern with 1, 2, and 3, um, and then ask Excel by clicking and dragging on the bottom part of that. Um, we can get this to go all the way up to 100.
right about to there. Uh, it looks like it uh, detected my colors a little bit funky, so I'll turn them all gray like that. And I'll add a little bit of lines on there. So that's how we say do this a hundred times, right? Eventually we're going to take whatever code we're developing here and redo it a hundred times all the way down to the bottom. So let's mark that as complete. Now we get on to the next, start, next step inside of the um, loop itself. Pick a random direction. Randomness implies that we're going to need a random number generator. Um, and in any, it, well, I shouldn't say in any, in most languages, you've got your pick from a couple of different kinds of random number generators. Um, usually the two that are nearly guaranteed to exist in most languages are a random number between 0 and 1 uh, and a random integer between some range. If you need anything other than that, usually it's kind of a matter of taking the existing generator and somehow doing some math to it to make it give you the number that you want, right? Remember when we were doing the spinners, those can only go by integers, and sometimes we had to do math to them to, say, go by increments of 0.1, right, or go for a different range. Often random number generators are subject to those same sort of tricks um, because you've only got a limited number of generators in a particular language. Um, like I said, 0 to 1 and some kind of an integer in a range, those are pretty common ones that exist in most languages. Um, so in um, Excel, we're going to represent the directions that we choose as integers, as either 1, 2, 3, or 4. Um, so the numbers that we're going to choose are either a 1, a 2, a 3, or a 4. Um, and the direction that we're going to go based on 1, 2, 3, 4, I'm just going to pick kind of like the unit circle goes. So 1 is to the right, uh, 2 is going up, 3 is going to the left, and 4 is going down. So we're kind of going around a circle in a, a counterclockwise um, direction. And so we need to pick a random integer between 1 and 4. Um, to pick a random number in, or I should say random integer in Excel, the function that we're going to use um, is called rand between, R-A-N-D between. And the syntax is tell it the range that you want, right? Go from low to high. So if we wanted it between um, 1 and 4, what we would have here is ran between 1 and 4, right? Ran between 1 and 4 um, is going to give us a random number between 1 and 4. Um, so I'm going to come back over here to sort of our, our code window, um, and we'll put the number in here. And we'll say this is our random number that we're choosing. Um, and we're going to let Excel choose that number for us by saying equals rand between uh, 1, 4. And when I say equals rand um, between 1, 4, I get, in this case, the number 2. Most likely you didn't get the number 2, or at least 75% of the time you won't also get the number 2. Um, you're obviously going to get a random number um, as we go. So now how do we recognize that 2 corresponds to up. There's a number of different ways to do this, and we're going to look at two more ways on Wednesday. Um, but the way that we're going to use is a tool that we've already used before, which is indexing. So the number 2 here that we've chosen as our random number happens to correspond, not by accident, uh, to the second row of the little uh, table that we're generating over here. It corresponds to up. So what I can do is say use this random number that I generated as an index into the column vector that um, I've generated here for directions. So if I give a 1, it'll be right. If it's 3, it's left, etc., etc. So the direction that I've got here, I'm going to say equals index because that was the um, indexing function that we learned before. I'm going to select the vector that I'm interested in, um, which is this right, up, left, down that I, we've got over here in our notes. And which row do I want? Well, the row that I want is this random number generator, or this random number that was generated previously, um, the number 3, right? I, I want that to be my index, and I want that to change uh, randomly as we do more and more steps. Um, and so that'll tell me which direction I'm going which, sure enough, 3 is left. That was what I expected. So I'll continue increasing our number here, or increasing our table. I'm also going to change the size just a little bit so that I can fit a little bit more on one screen, um, just so that you can um, 
see what's going on a little bit better without me having to scroll back and forth. Let's make that index a little bit smaller there too. So left is great, right? But left is not a it's not a number that we can use, right? We need to say, are we going actually taking the x and adding one to it? Are we subtracting one to the x? Are we going up the y? Or what, what, do we, what are we doing here? There is a common way that we represent that sort of change in position when we're doing a simulation. Um, so if we look back over at our random walk, uh, we had already set uh, the distance by which we would like to move equal to one. Um, where we had this distance 1, um, and where we had added, well, I shouldn't say that one, we had added a 1 here, we had subtracted a 1 over here. That's the distance by which we're moving, and it's 1 in every direction, so it doesn't matter um, if we were uh, going up and down or left and right. This distance up here is also equal to 1. The way that we usually denote that uh, in a simulation is one of two symbols. If it's in code, we would call this distance, the one here, dx, right? It's the distance we ch that's changed in the x direction. Um, another way that we often will see this written, at least in, usually more in uh, written, I don't want to say written code, in like written documents, like a textbook or a website or something like that, you may or may not see it written as dx. You may or may not see it written as delta x. Those mean the same thing. It's the change in x. Um, you might think back to your calculus course too. There is actually a difference between a delta x, like a change in x, and what we would call dx as the infinitesimally small change in x. That's more of a calculus kind of thing um, that we're not worried about right now. As far as we're concerned, dx and delta x are interchangeable. It's just how far did you go? Um, and similarly, the change in y, we would call that either dy or delta y. It's how far did you go. And in all cases for this simulation, it's going to be plus or minus one. Um, it depends on which way you're going, um, but they're always going to be plus or minus one. If you go to the left, then it's minus one. If you go to the right, then it's going to be plus one. The deltas, you can put the symbol delta in um, Excel. I, I'm not aware of a way to do it in MATLAB. Um, but it's just kind of more pain than it's worth. Uh, so I just tend to call them dx and dy. Uh, so we have to determine the corresponding values of dx and dy. Um, in order to do that, we can add um, a couple of, uh, I don't want to say columns. Yeah, columns. Adding columns to our um, growing table over here. Uh, so we'll have dx and dy. Um, and similarly, we're going to have to determine the dx and the dy each time we update the position of the particle. So here's our growing table. And now we have to sort of enumerate all of the different possibilities that dx and dy can take. So if we go to the right, that means that dx changed by plus 1 and dy didn't change at all. Remember, there's no... Uh, what would you call that, interdimensional steps, you can't step on an angle, right? It's either a pure step to the right or left, or a pure step up or down. Um, so one of these values is always going to be plus or minus 1, the other is 0. If we wanted to go up, then there's no change in x and a plus 1 change in y. If we wanted to go left, it's a minus 1 and a 0. And if we wanted to go down, it's a 0 and a minus 1. So those are all of the possibilities um, that our particle can take. And now we have to pick the correct one um, depending on what our random number generator um, developed. So we picked a 3. Uh, we know that it's left, but again, left is not exactly what we want. But we can use that same indexing tool to pull out the correct value of dx based on that random number generator in the same way that we pulled out the, the word left. So we can say equals index. And now the vector that we're interested in is dx, and the index that we want is still that random number 3, or whatever the random number generator happened to give. So it looks pretty much the same as the direction, it's just now we're extracting out of dx instead of, dy, instead of the direction. So let's close that. Uh, and similarly for dy, we're going to say index. What's the vector that we want? Well, we want to go into the vector dy um, because that's got all of the directions that we want, and we want to extract out whatever row corresponds to our random integer that we've developed, which again is in this case 2, but it changes actually. You may have noticed that number keeps changing 
random number numbers in um, Excel regenerate every time something changes um, on the worksheet. So it, it doesn't really matter um, what changes, uh, it will generate a new random number. And finally, we have to do, I guess we can go ahead and pick this uh, or mark this as completed, right? We've now picked a random direction. Now we need to update the particle position. To update the particle position, we look back at our notes that we had um, previously uh, and say, what did we do to update the particle position? Well, the thing that we did to update the particle position was that example over there on the right where we said, take the old position um, and add to it the change, right? We added to it actually both changes. Um, and I pointed that out on purpose last time because we don't want to have to worry about making a decision of which one we update. We just want to update them both and let that decision sort of be handled by the indexing that we did before, right? Adding zero is the same as not changing. It's a little bit easier to code add zero to something than it is to say don't change it. Um, although there are ways to do it and we'll sort of explore those ways um, once we get into MATLAB. So this is what we have to do. We have to take the old value and add um, to it the change um, and then that becomes the new value. Often that will look something of a structure like this. We take the old value of x, so let's say that is x old, um, and we add to it delta x, and this now becomes the new value of x. And similarly uh, with y, we can say that the new value of y is equal to the old value of y, not x, y old, plus the change in y, which is delta y, or dy, right? We're calling it dy, um, either one. But that concept of taking the old one, calculating some kind of an update to it, and then adding to that old one, and that becomes the new one, that's a very common thing in a lot of um, simulations that come up in, in engineering and science, is the last one was roughly where we needed to be, and then we add a correction to it, or we add a movement to it, or something like that. So that type of formula is a pretty common um, one that we're going to encounter in our um, code. So let's go back over to our growing uh, box here, uh, and we'll calculate our new values of x and y. So this value of x is going to be equal to the last one, plus the change in x. And similarly for um, y, we're going to take the last value of y and add to it the change in y. Right? And that gives us our, our new value of y. And I'm also going to do just a little bit of labeling here so that those quantities that I had just brought up um, are present here as well. So when you think of these two values, conceptually, what do those represent? Or I should say those two columns. These are the old values. The dx and the dy are the change, and the new, or the, the x and y over here on the right are the new values. Winston, your butt is on my keyboard, man. You gotta move it a little bit. I can't reach my shift key because his butt is on the keyboard. Okay, well, we've reached a tenuous agreement of where we're going to be. So I'm just labeling the columns here um, so that we get a little bit of an idea of um, exactly what we're doing. Right, we've got some old values, we determine a change based on the random number generation, and then calculate a new value as equal to the old plus the change. Now we have to do that a hundred times, right? That's part of our um, pseudocode that we've got over there. So how do we do something over and over and over in Excel? We use the autofill. Um, but there's a little bit of a problem in the autofill. If we take this entire row um, and drag this down, almost all of that is incorrect in one way or the other. The only thing that's currently working the way that it needs to is the random number generation and the updating position. So let's kind of unpack what happened. The first problem is that these are still the number zero, right? If I look at the x and y, the old x and y values for the second iteration, right, which is now our second row, those numbers are still zero. 
But that's not what we're supposed to be doing, right? We're supposed to take a step and then treat that as our current position and add one in some direction or subtract one in some direction. So we need to link these to our, our previous values. Um, and so what we're going to do is establish a link um, between the previous value of x, which is this one, um, and we're just going to have that essentially be copy-pasted over to um, the current value of x and y. Similarly, um, the old value of y that we have over here needs to be written into the new value of y. It's not that we're doing a new calculation, right? We're just sort of updating the present position of the particle because I'm going to have to repeat this process all over again. So I want to have an updated position. I don't know if I would really call that a, a calculation or not because we're not really calculating a new number. We're just kind of pulling those numbers down so that they um, represent sort of the current position um, of the particle. So what I'm going to do here with the x is I'm going to say just make that equal to the previous value. And similarly make the y value equal to the previous value. So those are all linked. Um, but that's different from what we started with in the first row uh, because the first row was uh, just a 0 and a 0. In fact, I'm going to take these two um, and change their color a little bit because those cells are unique. So I'm going to put those in light blue. Those cells are unique in the sense that they're fixed as a constant, right? They're always a 0. But what we're hoping is that everywhere going forward, we can just repeat a particular pattern over and over and over again because we don't want to have to make 100 updates to two different columns, right? That's a lot of typing. So that's one of the updates that we need. The other update is a little bit more subtle, and you have to remember how the index or the, how the sort of autofill feature in Excel works. Um, if you double click on um, RAND, the random number generator, this one is still fine, right? It's still generating a random number between 1 and 4. That's what we want, so that one's good. But if you look at the direction that it shows, the index that it's referring to, which row it's taking, that's fine, right? It's still taking the third one. But look over there in the blue um, over here, and you'll see that that reference to that vector updated a little bit, right? It slid down by one, which is not good, right? Now there's an entry down there at the bottom that doesn't have any direction associated with it. So we need to lock the cells so that that particular element doesn't change. Um, and I'm going to show you how to do that on the direction, um, and then I'm going to give you a couple of minutes uh, to try it for yourself to then update dx and dy and see if you can run the simulation um, the rest of the way. So I'm going to show you how to do the direction here in a moment, um, and then we're going to go till, uh, I don't know, maybe 337. See if you can update dx, dy, um, and then autofill all remaining um, entries. Uh, and we're going to come back at about maybe 337 um, to check what that looks like. So the correction that you're going to have to make, and I'll update it for direction, um, is you're going to have to put dollar signs in. Um, for me, it's uh, C12 to C15, um, and I need to offset it by 1, right? So actually, it doesn't need to be C12. It needs to be C11, and it doesn't need to be C15. It needs to be C14, right? I'm, I'm looking over here in the blue to make sure that they're always in the correct location. So your dx always needs to be that column vector of dx values, and your dy always needs to be the column vector of dy. So I'm going to leave that um, displayed, uh, and we'll go until, actually, let's go till 338, because I talked a little bit more than I wanted. Um, I'm also over in the chat, remember, on Canvas, if you needed to ask any questions. Uh, but I'm going to disappear, disappear for a minute uh, and see if you can handle the dx, the dy, and then see if your drag and drop works reasonably.
All right, if I want to update the dx and dy, I do roughly the same thing that I did for updating the direction uh, in terms of locking cells. Um, I'm going to show you two different ways to lock the cells. One is the same way that we did um, previously, which if you were watching what, uh, like watching the individual numbers that I did, I just enter them on the keyboard. Um, it's not a bad way to do it. It's workable. So I'm going to say dollar sign D12 and dollar sign D15, um, and then I'm going to change those by one, right? I mean, instead of 12, I'm going to say 11 because I need it to be up by one, um, and also 14. Uh, so instead of 12 to 14, or sorry, 12 to 15, I say it's 11 to 14, um, and that updates it. Um, just fine. The other way to do it, um, and I'm going to use dy as a way to do that, if you double click on the um, cell that you're in, you can grab the blue vector that you've got and drag the blue vector around. Um, so in order to do that, you have to click and hold uh, on the edge of the vector that you've got. Um, so if you're in the middle, it won't work where you have this sort of large white plus sign, um, but if you move towards the edge, you get that sort of movement symbol. It looks like a, a set of axes. Um, if you click and hold on that, you can drag it around. Um, that's usually how the way I do it, because I'm honestly not very reliable at doing the math to, to update those numbers um, the way that I need to, unless it just happens to be one. So once I've got those, now I can go in and add the dollar signs. Um, so I'm going to add the dollar signs that way. The changes to the new and the old, or sorry, the new X and the new Y, those still look like they're okay, right? Their references are okay. Um, if I look at both of those, it's still taking the old X and the old Y. This um, trickiness of updating the um, sort of first step in the um, iteration, that's usually the hardest. First um, iteration is usually hardest. Not all the time. Um, you know, there, there can be ways to end it that are, are more difficult. Um, there may be the initialization that's more difficult sometimes. Um, but often getting that first iteration correct, that's the one where the weirdest things start to happen, right? Because you're now relying on the code to update itself based on its previous position. And so it can kind of wander off pretty quickly um, if you don't get it exactly correct. Because of that difficulty, I'm usually in the habit of running the simulation for just a handful of steps, like three, four, five steps, something like that. Because if I'm going to run a simulation for 10,000 steps, it may take a couple of minutes or longer for that simulation to complete. And I don't want to wait that long to find out that I made a mistake. Um, that's most common. The reason, most often the reason why I don't want to run it that long. Um, so to run, let's say, five steps of our um, simulation, I'm going to grab that row and I'm just going to drag down to the fifth row um, of our simulation. And now I'm just going to look at the fifth row and double check that all of its references are working the way that it should. So the old values look right, right? They're sort of pointed up towards, uh, or I should say the new values are pointed up towards the previous values, so that looks okay. Um, same for Y, going in the right space. Uh, the random number generator still going okay. It's between one and four. Um, and then I could look at this really without even checking the reference just to know it's correct, right? I know three had to go left, and it is, um, which means it has to change the X by minus one and the Y by zero. That's exactly what it did here. Uh, but if I wanted to double check, I could double, double, check, double click on any of those cells, um, and it would show me that it's referring to the correct value. And then the new value and the old value look like they're updating correctly based on the previous one. Do note, though, exactly how I dragged that uh, formula down. So if you look back to the way that it was previously, I grabbed only row 2. How come I grabbed only row 2 instead of row 1 and 2? Well, if I grow, grab row 1 and 2, if I drag it down 1, it's repeated the the original row, which is row 1. If I drag it down again, now it's re repeated the second row. And now I do it again, or actually, in this case, it's actually grabbing the first one every single time, which is kind of weird. You'll get an even different behavior um, if you drag, drag multiple uh, increments here. Uh, let's get rid of this color. These are all things not to do, by the way. So if you grab these two rows and, uh, rows and drag a few of them, now you get like an alternating... Start at zero, update, then start at zero, then update, and then zero, 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 and then you've got 
you know, colors back and forth um, as you go, none of which is correct. Um, the reason for that is because that first row is unique, right? This was our initialization. So this one was initialization. So that one is going to be different from the other ones. That's one of the reasons why I highlighted that um, in blue. It was to remind us that that one is a little bit different from everything else. So the only one we want to repeat is actually the second one. Um, so now we can go ahead and drag that. Uh, like I said before, if we drag it five, everything seems to be working. Um, you can drag it all the way to the bottom, or you can highlight that row and double click it, and it'll autofill all the way to the bottom. Um, if you're worried about it, you can go down to the bottom and check it um, to see if it's got um, the correct um, set in them, right? Whether it's still behaving the correct way. So in the last uh, maybe three minutes, um, try to create a plot of x versus y um, using a, a line plot. And try to get it as best you can to look something like this kind of a plot. It, it's okay if it doesn't look exact. We're going to get it close um, on Wednesday's lecture. Um, but you know, try to get it as a black line. Try to get those squares as roughly square. See how far you can get um, by about, let's say, 347 or so. Um, I will disappear and, and give you a little bit of time to work on that, but let's go by till 347. All right, let's go ahead and make our plot really quick. We're not going to get all the way through the plot by the time we're done. But let's go ahead and get started. The first thing we have to do is choose which set of x and y do we actually want to calculate. The correct set of x and y that we want, or not calculate, that we want to plot. The correct set to plot is the set over here on the left. The reason for that is because the particle starts at 0, 0. Um, if you look over at the new values, the first value that's written over on the new value is not 0, 0. Um, and so we have to start from this side. Technically, we've simulated 101 steps, right? If you go all the way down to the bottom uh, to row 100, 
this set, the three and the four in my case, um, that's the 100th step. This set, the three and the five, that's the 101st step. We don't really care about that, and we're not going to care about the fact that we calculated it and don't need it. Um, so the only ones that we're interested in is this column that starts at zero. I'm going to use the keyboard shortcuts to highlight this really quickly. So I'm going to highlight the two columns I want, and then hit Control, Shift, and the down arrow on my keyboard to select them all at once all at once. And then I'm going to insert a scatter plot as a line. Um, I'm going to move that up a little bit so that we can see it up here. And here is our plot. If we wanted to get it looking close to what we had seen before, I would delete the title because uh, we don't need that. And then I'm going to resize this until the squares that I'm interested in, the, you know, the steps that we've got are, are roughly square. Um, that's one of the things that we're going to have to come back to on Wednesday um, to make it look square all the time. Um, because if I change something about it and recalculate um, the random number, it, uh, so for example, let's just enter a new number, um, it resets the entire simulation, right? And it may end up uh, scaling it in such a way that it doesn't look um, square anymore, uh, the, the number of steps that we take one or the other. Plus, it's a little bit annoying for it to change every single time, right? I'm just entering new numbers here to make it rerun, and the whole changing of the plot is a little annoying, um, versus the way that it was set up over here, where the grid appears to be fixed. Um, and that's one of the things that we're going to change on uh, Wednesday. If you think you know how to do that already, I'll give you a hint. It's just a matter of fixing the axes. Um, and then we're also going to add a couple of additional points of the dot representing the actual particle at the end of the simulation. Um, and then we'll add a little bit more um, post-processing for how do we uh, calculate the displacement. That's where we're actually going to learn something about randomness um, that's not really related to the simulation. Last thing I'll finish with is we are going to look at different ways to do the um, selection of dx and dy. So we were using indexing, right? Each time we wanted to calculate these, we indexed into a vector. And I did that because indexing is so important in MATLAB. Um, but we're also going to learn two other methods um, of essentially conditional statements and if statements um, that are other ways to do exactly the same thing um, so that you can see them a few times before we get started uh, with um, MATLAB. So I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, I will stick around over in the Canvas chat if anybody's got any questions. Um, I hope you stay safe. hope you stay healthy. Um, you're now in a position to pretty much finish all of homework one. There's a small calculation you have to do at the end, but like the vast majority of it, you can accomplish it um, already with what we've done here. So I'll wrap it up. We'll see you on Wednesday. Have a good one, everybody. Mm -hmm.